Thank you, everybody. It's such an, whoops, such an honor to be here. You know, I think that the reason that I was invited to speak with you this morning is because there are three things I do extremely well, one of which is listen. I have an ability to hear and to listen that's um, quite amazing. And to give you a sense of that so that you can come to know me instantly, I ask my friends Joanne and Stephanie to join me here for a moment on the stage. Before I say anything about music or myself, I'd like you to take a listen and a look. Johann Sebastian Bach in all his glory, and uh, the prelude from his G major suite, a piece with which I think many of you might already be familiar. But I'm wondering if when you listen to it, you hear what I hear. What I hear, and what I've always heard, is what Bach intended, which is a low note that comes back over and over and over again. And if we were to just deconstruct the piece for a moment, and I ask Joe to just play the low note for you, this is what you might hear. <laughs> is not only low, but each time it's the very same note over and over again. On top of that note, Bach makes these embellishments. The embellishments by themselves sound like this. <laughs> they become the G major prelude. Somehow, I've always been able to hear that. I, I could hear the separation between those two different ideas which Bach had from a very young age. But I've always imagined that not everybody on the planet was born just like me. Well, not everybody was raised by my mother. That's subject too. <laughs> and so I have made a decision in my life to commit myself to offering everybody in the world the opportunity to hear the way I hear and listen the way I listen, because I believe that in the art of listening, is the art of changing the world. That's why I invited Stephanie, 
because if you look very closely at what Stephanie's doing, she is giving you the information Bach intended for you to have. So for every low note, you'll see something like this. Can you hear the low notes? And for every embellished note, she, you'll hear something like this. So if you and I used your mind's ear and attached that mind's ear to your mind's eye, and I asked Stephanie to play for you, and I used the word play literally, the beginning of this Bach prelude, can you tell me if you would hear it? And if we put them both together again, we get this. Thank you both. So I, I can't say I was actually born with the gift of being able to listen like that. I was really born as the daughter of Diana Zachariah Warby, who went to college for the first time at age 50, and by 54 had a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD in feminist literature who raised three kids essentially by herself, as women did in those days when their husbands went off to work and who did so on what I would describe as a working class income, who marched in Selma, Alabama, who protested against the atom bomb, and who, when she was pregnant with me, asked my dad to go out and find a piano for the house. It was a small spinet piano. The plastic on top of most of the keys was broken off. But when I was five, I took my first piano lesson. And I liked it. And when I was six, I was continuing to take a weekly piano lesson. And teachers told my parents that I had a certain talent for the piano. And this went on basically through fifth or sixth grade with me happily or willingly practicing about 30 minutes a day. You would think that when I got to seventh grade, I would have wanted to up it to 45 minutes a day, but I actually wanted to decrease it to 20 minutes a day. There was a sentence that my mother and father said to me. It went like this, as long as you live under our roof, there's, there are two things you will do every day. Brush your teeth and practice the piano. By seventh grade, I was one smart, obnoxious kid. And uh, practicing piano became a daily battle. And by eighth grade, I would say that our house of five people, one bathroom and two bedrooms, I shared a room with my brothers, had become a war zone. And the war was me versus my parents on the subject of piano. They threatened me and said if I quit the piano, I would lose my social privileges, which included the telephone and all after school and weekend activities. That seemed to be enough to keep me 
practicing through the eighth grade. But in the ninth grade, I announced that I was going to give up the phone and my friends and weekends in exchange for not having to practice the piano every day. Um, my parents agreed, never thinking that I would be able to go through with it, but I did. A teacher came to my public high school of many, many thousands of people who decided to start a small elite choir. He auditioned kids for it and then announced that he was looking for an accompanist and the accompanist would be chosen by audition. The choir was to meet seventh period, which was when I had study hall. And I had already gotten four or five slips from study hall for passing notes or talking, which put me in detention. And uh, after a certain accumulation of detentions, you were uh, expelled. And this choir director was going to rehearse the choir during seventh period. I auditioned. I still played the piano better than anybody else at the school. I got the gig, and I started rehearsing every day during seventh period with this choir. And I never told my parents. <laughs> and the winter concert came, and I somehow was able to finagle my way out of the house because it was at night. I think the lie was a math tutor, which was quite believable. <laughs> I went, I played. It was, there were lots of huge piano solos, which I, of course, played effortlessly. The choir got a standing ovation. I got my own ovation. I went home. I went to bed, I got up for school the next morning, went home from, came home from school, and my mother was standing at the front door, and this is how she looked. <laughs> Wait until your father gets home. <laughs> my father came home, they went into the bedroom, they closed the door. My parents had a major, major deal about the united front. And uh, it turned out that my mother had been receiving phone calls all day from all her neighbors and all her friends. Where were you last night? We looked all over for you. Rachel was amazing. Rachel, what? And of course, you know, she played the piano. She got her own ovation. It was quite extraordinary. We looked all over for you and Lou, but you were nowhere to be found. So for the rest of ninth grade, I lived with no social life, no phone, no phone, no weekend activities at all, and practicing the piano every day for an hour <laughs> to make up for the semester that I hadn't practiced a half an hour. But let me just tell you, it nearly broke my family because I was so angry about having to play the piano. And it lasted through the end of ninth grade, all of 10th grade, on all of 11th grade. My mother never gave up on it. So when I was in 12th grade, you can imagine that auditioning for music schools seemed the natural thing to do. So I went to a music school and majored in piano and graduated from college and did what every young piano major does when she graduates from college. She teaches other horrible kids who don't want to practice the piano, <laughs> piano lessons every day and gets in her car and schleps all over God's creation to do so. The thing of it is, when I was five, I had this notion that I was a great listener because I believed that I was Leonard Bernstein. You must understand, when my own daughter was five, she, and six and seven, she believed she was La Serenita, the mermaid. <laughs> she didn't believe she was 
Dianita being a mermaid, she believed she was a mermaid. And when she was six on Halloween, my parents sent her a mermaid costume. She was deeply consternated. She could not fathom why a mermaid would need to wear a mermaid costume. <laughs> I had great empathy for her because I couldn't fathom at five why people would say to me, you mean you want to be like Leonard Bernstein and pat me on the head kind of um, in, in some concerned way. It, it, this did not compute with me. I didn't want to be like Leonard Bernstein. I already was Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> and so when I came to my senses after teaching piano, after going to graduate school at Brandeis University to get a PhD in musicology, while I was teaching uh, music history at MIT and at the New England Conservatory of Music, it dawned on me that in fact, I wasn't Leonard Bernstein and that the missing link was that I wanted to be a conductor. So I wrote 10 letters to 10 different teachers of conductors all over the world. Nine of them never wrote me back. One of them wrote me back entirely in French and said, obviously with a doctorate from Brandeis University in musicology and a being a studious pianist, having studied with Schabach and Bloomington, having played piano for Janos Starker's master classes, you're a very gifted musician. However, I cannot take you into my conducting studio. You're a woman, and women don't conduct. He lived in New York. He taught at Columbia. I lived in Boston, obviously. But I took this letter and I got on the Amtrak train almost the next day and went to New York, got off, got, on a, got off the train, got on a subway, got off at 110th Street and walked to his apartment on Riverside Drive. And I rang the bell of his apartment and I heard somebody from the other side of the door say, Oui, and I do speak French, and I said, you know, je suis Raquel Robby, et je vous écris, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And from the other side of the door, I hear, oui. So, you know, my I speak French turns into, I think I speak French. And I say the whole thing again, and I hear, oui. And then I sort of held up the letter to the little peephole in the door and showed him the letter and his signature. Oui. And uh, then suddenly I hear all these deadbolt locks and the door opens and standing in front of me is a man who makes Albert Einstein in his worst day look like Prince Charles. I mean, <laughs> gray hair out to here, filthy stained shirt, uh, Galois cigarettes and behind him a room full of smoke, books piled high on the floor like Stonehenge and two grand pianos and I walk in behind him and uh, he says to me in French, tell me what you know about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Yes, I think. So I begin slowly in French. Well, I'm t 10 words in and he starts lecturing me endlessly hour upon hour, in French, about Beethoven's Fifth and about the harmonic structure and the theoretical structure and the historic significance. And I'm following him 90% of the time, I think, and then I think I have no idea what he's saying 90% of the time. I'm getting more and more tired. He hasn't said one word to me except to holler at me about Beethoven's Fifth, and he's jamming on pianos and throwing books in my lap. And after several hours, uh, he, I hear no sound, and I realized he stopped speaking. And I say, pardonnez-moi, monsieur, uh, je ne comprends pas. And he says, looking right at me, you get it? 
And I'm thinking, oh boy, my French is, I just can't understand what he's saying. And I say again, pardonnez-moi. And he says again, you get it? And after the third time, I suddenly realize that he's speaking in English, saying, I know you knew that, but I didn't know that, because <laughs> um, I've compressed three hours into three minutes. And he, I, I said, he said, you get it the third time. And I said, do you speak English? And he said, but of course. And then he walked me to the door of his apartment, and he said, Mademoiselle Roby, I hope you have a very safe trip back to Boston, huh? A woman cannot be a conductor. So it's Thursday, you arrived here 2 p.m. I will see you next week, 2 p.m. Monsieur, I said, are, are you going to be my teacher? No, mademoiselle, ce n'est pas possible. A woman cannot be a conductor. I went every week for two years. At the end of every single lesson, this man walked me to his door. And first he called me Mademoiselle Roby, then he called me Raquel, and by into about a year and a half he called me Chérie. But it didn't matter. Chérie, mwah, mwah. I hope you have a very safe trip back to Boston, but I want you to remember one thing. Huh? A woman cannot be a conductor. You know, I never thought about it. I never, I, I never thought about what he was saying. I never thought about the impact it might have on me. Somebody announced an audition uh, to get a position as an assistant conductor with a major symphony orchestra. So I applied and I was accepted. And I was one of 40 people who went to Denver, Colorado to conduct the Denver Symphony. It was 39 men and me. And when I told him I was invited, he said, ce n'est pas possible, chérie. A woman cannot be a conductor. And they made the first cut, and it was down to 20 people, 19 men and me. And I called him, and he said, ce n'est pas possible, chérie. A woman cannot be a conductor. And it was down to three people, and it was going to be some sort of acknowledgement, regardless of whether or not I won. Uh, I won, I called him, it was of no consequence to him whatsoever <laughs> because he believed that a woman could not, should not, would not, women do not conduct. And years later, I ran into him in New York. By this time, I had been on television shows, my picture had been in magazines, I had Leonard Bernstein's job at Carnegie Hall conducting the young people's concerts, and I ran into him right in front of Juilliard. Jacques, I said, ça va? Oui, chérie, ça va bien. What are you doing with yourself these days, he said to me. <laughs> so, I, I tell you this anecdote because I want to tell you that um, in addition to being the listener I am, I came to discipline through my mother and the combination of my uncanny ability to listen and my mother's drive to teach me the art of discipline. I became a most courageous and fearless passionate artist. Because I can tell you that in the final round, when I stood in front of the Denver Symphony Orchestra and I was called out, all of the brass section got up and walked out. All of the brass section were men and they all got up and walked out. And you know, it's a wonderful privilege in 2014 on a gorgeous, slightly too hot September day, right here to giggle about it. But you cannot imagine the knocking knees on this woman and the intense panic I had because I had no idea. I had no inkling whatsoever that this was going to be some kind of a pioneering effort. 
I just did it because I could hear fantastic things and because I had the discipline to learn it. I could discipline myself to communicate that which I could hear. That was given to me by my mother. She was the woman who mentored me. She is the woman upon whose shoulders I stand. But the passion that I was able to build from those two talents is the one thing about me that sets me apart from everyone else. Because my passion is not built on my artistry. My passion is built out of my discipline, out of the fact that I do it more every single day than anybody else. Forget Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. I left those by in my first year of college. This became something that I knew how to do. And my drive is only built on my passion to bring music to as many people as possible, no matter who they are. Several years ago, I read a book entitled Holocaust, and it was about the men and women who lived in the ghettos, especially the Warsaw Ghetto, and also in the alleged model camp of Theresienstadt, whose passion drove them to write words, create paintings, write music that would bear witness to what they were experiencing and bury those documents only one day hoping that they would be found. When they were unearthed, the stories these artists told were uncompromising, unfailing in their power. But what drove that power was their passion and their discipline, their discipline to continue to listen to themselves as artists, even when they were experiencing the greatest distress ever known to humankind. I do not compare myself to those men and women except in so far as neither their busts nor mine will ever line a museum hallway. Our work is to be with you. Our work is our passion to make sure that live art lives because we are the people, I am a person who believes singularly that live art, something you can touch and feel, is the magnet that will help us one by one change not every woman's life, not every man's life, not every child's life, but every life. Thank you. I do have um, a parting gift. Um, which I bring to you with all my heart, all my joy, all my gratitude, and all my sincerest belief that um, women hold up the entire sky.
Thank you.